I call to order the joint meeting of the Glendale City Council and the Glendale Economic Development Corporation for December 15th, 2015. May we have roll call for the council? Uh, Mr. Mayor, if you would allow me just to ensure that Council Member Sinanyan, who is attempting to Skype in, is with us. Council Member Sinanyan? Here. Okay. Sorry, we will now take roll. Council Members Devine? Here. Friedman? <clears throat> Here. Carpetian? Here. Sinanyan? Here. Here in Ajarian. Here. And roll call for the Economic Development Corporation. Board members Devine? Here. Friedman? Here. Magar Petian? Here. Sinanian? Here. Chair Najarian? Here. Will you please read your report? The agenda for the December 15, 2015 special joint public meeting of the City Council and Economic Development Corporation was posted on Monday, December 14, 2015 on the Bolton Board outside City Hall and in the main lobby office of Jones Day, New York. Thank you. And what's the first item? Mr. Mayor and Council, I believe there is a special presentation for Ms. Elisa Glickman that was going to be uh, this evening. Um, but that is up to you as to if you would like to take it now or after uh, as one of the last items of this meeting. Would you like to take it now, Ms. Glickman? <laughs> Let's give it to you first. Let's start with the good news. Okay, please come forward, Ms. Glickman. This is a special presentation, and I've been... Um, uh, it has been requested by Council Member Friedman that she kick this off. Yes, uh, Lisa Glickman is a very modest individual. I didn't tell anybody in the city that she had won the 2015 Megan G. Cooper Leadership Award for her leadership as the Executive Director of Glendale Arts. <clears throat> and this is a very prestigious award in the nonprofit community, and you cannot keep it a secret from everybody. So somebody told me about this, and so I asked that we make a formal commendation to you because you deserve it. You look like you're in pain. I am absolutely in pain. Uh, we're going to drag this on then a little bit longer. <laughs> so I'll, I'll then go ahead and read the entire uh, mayor's commendation. Although maybe the mayor should read it since it's from him, and then I'll bring it up and present it to you. How's Mr. Sinanyan doing? Can you hear us loud and clear, sir? Um, okay, well, I don't believe his microphone okay. is on, Mr. Um, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I'm doing very well. Thank you. <laughs> um, this mayor's commendation is presented to Alyssa Glickman, the executive director of Glendale Arts. Congratulations on receiving the 2015 Megan G. Cooper Leadership Award for your wonderful leadership services as an executive director. I commend your hard work and dedication in working with members of the community and various nonprofit organizations. Your outstanding guidance and exemplary leadership has helped provide many wonderful amenities within our community. Congratulations on a job well done. I thank you for representing Glendale and serving as a shining example to all. On behalf of the city of Glendale, I, we, wish you <laughs> continued success. Thank you. Thank you very much. In case we don't say it enough, well done. Thank you. You've done an amazing job here for the city and for the arts. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And let's go to the first item on the agenda. First item is Director of Economic Development regarding Glendale Arts Fiscal Year 2014-15, third and fourth quarter, and year-end reports for the Alex Theater. 1A is a motion to note and file the Alex Theater quarterly reports from Glendale Arts for the periods of January 1st to March 31st, 2015, and April 1st to June 30th, 2015, and third and fourth quarter of fiscal year 2014-15, and the year-end report for July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2015. 
Mr. Ochoa. Yes, sir. Very briefly, we'll have Cassandra Pruitt come forward and give you the update, and certainly you can ask her and or the Glendale Arts folks questions about the ongoing evolution of the use uh, and the positive momentum being generated uh, at the Alex Theater and hopefully what we can expect going forward. Cassandra. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council and GEDC Chair and members. I'm pleased to present to you the Glendale Arts Fiscal Year 2014 to 2015 third quarter report, fourth quarter report, and, and year-end report for the Alex Theater, and these cover the period of January through June of this year, 2015. In the third and fourth quarters, Glendale Arts did a very fine job of fulfilling its charge to provide a wide variety of high-quality programming at the theater, including community benefit and educational programming. They hosted their first ever production of Billy Elliot the Musical, which was Glendale Arts' first musical theater production since the completion of the Alex Theater Expansion Project. In terms of the year-end report, fiscal year 2014 to 2015 was the first year after the completion of the Alex Theater Expansion Project. Glendale Arts conducted a flurry of marketing and promotion activity to promote the new expansion space, and they've successfully generated a lot of interest. They also completed perhaps one of their most successful fundraising campaigns, where they raised $75,000 to restore the historic and iconic Alex Theater Neon Tower. In terms of the financials, the year closed with a net loss, but it's largely attributed to recovering from the nearly six months of closure during the expansion project in the previous year. In that year, Glendale Arts took out an internal loan to cover costs during the closure, and the loan was paid back in fiscal year 14 to 15. The loan is now paid off. No other loans have been taken out. The general reserve and capital reserve accounts have healthy balances. And the theater started off this new year to a very good start, with the first quarter ending with $150,000 in net income for the Alex Theater and $265,000 in net income for Glendale Arts. That concludes my report. Elisa Glickman, the CEO, is in attendance if you have specific questions for her. Thank you. Are there any? Questions for Cassandra or Ms. Glickman? Um, I'll ask a few yes, questions. Uh, uh, the sponsorships were, um, they missed the mark by 40,000, correct? In the previous you want to Okay. Um, in, in cash sponsorships, we did miss our mark, but we actually made up a lot of that ground through in kind donations, so um, which are not necessarily reflected on our financials. So when we look at those numbers, that gap actually closes to, I think it was somewhere around 30000 and in kind. So technically, we're looking at it as um, we had a $10,000 shortfall in sponsorships for the year. Um, but if you look at sponsorships sort of year over year, I think that you'll see that it has increased substantially since we launched our GA Partners program, I'm guessing about four years ago now. Okay, very, very good. And um, so the box office is running at a 50% loss. What Do you have any plans for that? So box office is an interesting thing. Um, m many theaters our size, many of our competitors use um, services like Ticketmaster, which charge exorbitant service fees on a per-ticket basis. We use um, a smaller provider because our per-ticket fees are much lower. Um, but some of the benefits that we get from them probably aren't as robust as, say, you would get from a ticket master. What we do assess in terms of fees are online walk-up fees and then our $2.50 per ticket fee, which goes into our restoration and programming account, which is restricted. When we talk about um, reimbursables, we're really looking at charge what we charge for internet, mailing, and, and walk-up fees. We're really looking at the threshold of how far we can push our patrons. Um, our ultimate goal is to keep um, ticket prices at an affordable rate while still providing quality entertainment. And we sort of feel like there's a small margin that we could possibly increase to, but maybe not as much as, say, $13.50 like Ticketmaster charges. We charge $3.75. In years past, we've obviously used the management fee to offset those expenses. So as we move forward in the management um, fee um, decreases uh, over time, we're going to obviously need to rethink the box office operation overall and find a ticket provider that will actually either handle that for us on their own or can further reduce our, uh, further reduce our costs. <coughs> so right now we're sort of 
willing to operate at a loss because we want to be able to provide that service to our clients and we also want to maintain those fees and we also have um, a full-time person who manages the box office in addition to part-time staff so we have to look at all of those things um, over the next couple of months and we're actually doing a needs assessment or a sort of a threshold assess assessment in the spring looking at what our competitors charge so it's a long-winded answer to a very easy question but it's always complicated when you talk about increasing fees and what our promoters and what our patrons are able to withstand. Well, it's just really good to know that you have a, a plan, you know, in place that, that you're going to be looking at in the future. So, mm -hmm. so that's good. And the other thing that interested me was that there were 11 cancellations this year as opposed to three last year. Do you, what, do, you, do you attribute that to the remodeling or? No, we think, um, we think that it's, it's, some of it has to do with um, promoter optimism. Um, oftentimes promoters get really excited about the show that they want to do and then reality sets in and they either can't move forward or time frames change or they can't get artist visas or something happens. Um, and some, in some cases it's finance, some cases it's ticket sales, some cases it's artist driven, and some cases is it's just we thought that we could pull this off and it turns out we really can't. Um, so it's also looking at the level of sophistication of the folks that come to us and want to rent the Alex and setting their expectation for what the costs are, which I think Marisa Hockian, who handles all of our marketing events, does exceptionally well, but really getting them to understand what promoting a show really means. I mean, we do this for a living. Um, and people get so excited about being in the entertainment business that they realize that the actual business of entertainment isn't as fun as it looks on TV. So um, that, that happens to us quite a bit. And unfortunately, this year, while our rentals are very strong, um, we've already had 15 cancellations this season. So we're seeing the trend, unfortunately, go north rather than south. Um, so we're hoping to, again, look at all of that and and figure out a way to, to help mitigate that moving forward. Are we still good for my one-man Hamlet? Yes. <laughs> that will never cancel. <laughs> but you have to promise uh, you were going to do a musical for me first, yes, weren't you? Yes, okay. Th Thank you, Elisa. I want to uh, congratulate you on your award. And, and I know if anybody can handle this and get programming uh, going and, and get the Alex uh, or keep the Alex sustainable. I know it's you. So thank, thank you so you. much. And your, and your staff. I was going to say, and the reason I look so pained whenever people say nice things about me is because I take all the credit for my staff's work. So, um, and they're incredibly hardworking, and they are the real reasons that the Alex has seen some success in the last couple I know, of years. And I just want to add that I get a lot of compliments about them. So I, I extend that uh, to them. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. I have Mr. Carpet. A couple of maybe. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> now I'm in trouble. <laughs> no, no. I just want to. I just want to summarize my understanding of this report and see if you are on the same page or not. Uh, when we signed the contract this year, uh, it was that uh, the reliance of the city's funding to decrease from 415,000 to 150,000 dollars over the next five years. Mm -hmm. And the way I read this report is the third quarter, our loss was only $9,500, and the fourth quarter is $21,000, and we paid the $120,000 loan. We paid it off, basically. So if this is the trend, we are already there. Am I, am I correct? We're getting there. Um, you know, keep in mind that we, we still have a management fee built into all of these numbers. Um, and while we did in the fourth quarter of last year lose more than we did in the third quarter, part of that was because we were preparing um, for the Alex 90 festivities and, and getting that together. One of the things that you'll also notice that as rentals increase, or even if we had, say, 28 days versus the previous year, which was 30 days, some productions that we had in in the fourth quarter were much larger, which meant that our exponential costs were larger. A lot of that is reimbursable from the client, so you'll also see those income levels be a little bit higher, as you'll note. Um, but I think overall, we are much closer to that um, beautiful term self-sufficiency than we probably were this time four years ago, um, simply because 
simply because the expansion, the reputation that we're building, and the, th and the fact that there are so many other destination points in downtown Glendale that the Alex Theater really isn't the only driving force bringing people into the community. So it's the Americana, it's the future Museum of Neon Art, Antius, and the Galleria. All of those projects combined put Glendale on um, the people's radar. And as that happens, people will start to discover the Alex Theater and all the wonderful programming that's taking place. So all of those things come into play. If that trajectory stays on the same path that it's currently on, we believe that by 2020, we will be able to um, rely less heavily on, on any sort of management fee. The only thing I can I, I like to add to that is I run some numbers. I'm a numbers guy, and uh, our labor cost, you know, versus our our, our income is 53 percent. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what kills any business. I exactly. Mean, there's no way around it. So uh, I think we have to we can't cut from our labor so much. We have to just try to increase our revenue so the balance will be. And and that's all part of that analysis that I mentioned uh, in answer to Council Member Devine's uh, question. Those are the, the things that we know, again, that our labor rates and in some cases our rental rates are much lower than our competitors in this particular market for a variety of reasons. We were able to sustain that for a tremendous amount of time simply because we had the management fee on an ongoing basis that allowed us to keep those dollars. Those down. Moving forward, that's not a luxury that we can absorb. So my team, we have a brand new director of theater operations with um, Maria's expertise and, and some folks that are doing this outside of Glendale and other places in the city, kind of city of Los Angeles, I should say, um, really looking at our reimbursable expenses and, again, what it is our promoters can, can, can bear. There are some promoters that can pay significantly more than what we charge, and then there are some promoters that could not perform or do their events at the Alex Theater if not for Glendale Arts subsidizing their performances. And so we don't want to take that advantage or that opportunity away from those promoters as well. So it's a, it's a really delicate balance. I can say in a little piece of bright news, if I might, um, or if I may, that we are in our first quarter of this fiscal year running about $80,000 ahead of where we were in the previous year. Um, so the, the news is, is much more more optimistic. Our fundraising is about $63,000 ahead of where we were this time in the previous year. So again, we see the trajectory moving in a very positive direction. And one last question. Are there any penalties for cancellation? Yes. So we have a penalty structure that's set up depending on where in the timeline a particular promoter cancels. Um, they will either be charged a certain amount, label reimbursements, rental um, expenses, etc. If we're able to re-rent that date, then we reduce those cancellation penalties, but there are some that are built into the process. Thank you. That's I, all I, have. I have another question, if I could. Uh, yes. The, um, you said we already have 15 cancellations. Were those of the the, the um, uh, bookings that you talked about at the last um, meeting? No, those are separate and distinct from Great. what we discussed the last time. Good. Those are sort of new people that came in and then came out just as quickly. Okay. Mr. Mayor. I, yes, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, I just want to congratulate and thank Glendale Arts and, the, and uh, Lisa Glickman and her staff on another year of successful operations. I really don't think any one of us or any one of our predecessors realistically thought that uh, uh, Alex Theater is going to be profitable overnight. And it's been a consistent positive trajectory and we're still on that trajectory. And um, I think they deserve our continued support and I certainly intend to support them in the future. So thank you, Lisa, a great job. And thank you to my colleagues for asking all these great questions. Thank you, council member. Uh, I have a few questions. Okay. What is what was the best booking in terms of revenue for for the Alex in the past year? I would say probably um, in terms of revenue to ourselves, um, we're probably looking at the Gay Men's Chorus of Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles Ballet's Nutcracker, and then the Wild Honey. Um, 
uh, Beatles tribute. Those are ones that were not promoted by Glendale Arts. Um, Billy Elliot the musical was certainly very successful for us as an organization. While I, I, I love to say successful, we did lose money on it. Um, but success in terms of the number of people that it brought into the downtown. Um, but our we do we do a percentage analysis of the yield that each show brings because those three shows that I mentioned do a heavy internet sales business and some other things and they have large load ins and load outs and rehearsal days those are some some very good yielding shows for us and we're running about 23% we have other clients um, who who we probably run about a, a 7% margin on um, so 23 is a, is a nice percentage uh, on average and, and those are some big shows the good news is, is the gay men's chorus for example did one performance with us when they came back last season they're doing three with us this year so an LA ballet increased their performance schedule from three to four so those are very optimistic for us again because they do such a, a, a heavy business and because a lot of those sales take place through our box office rather than as consignment ticket sales the number one thing that really hurts us with our box office operation is the number of consignment tickets we give so a promoter comes they want to produce an event they take a thousand of those tickets and they sell them on their own through their own sales infrastructure, which means that we're not making that per ticket fee, which means that we're not reimbursing ourselves for the time that our box office is spending on their event. Because the box office service, the basic service is included in their base rent. So the per event yield on those is significantly lower. So the, um, the promoter, uh, he or she sets the actual ticket prices. Correct. We're tacking on two and a half dollars as a, uh, as a service charge, or it's a restoration programming fee, two dollars and fifty cents if it's purchased through our box office. Plus, if you purchase online, it's an additional three dollars and seventy-five cents. If you walk up to any of our outlet windows, it's two dollars. Okay. And do we get a percentage of total ticket sales? We do not. Um, we unless we do a co-production, which is what we did with, say, the Nicholas Brothers tribute and and some other shows. We don't take any piece of their box office revenue, we essentially make our money through rent, reimbursable labor, and hopefully ticket sales through our box office. So the best case, the best type of booking is one where there's a lot of people in the seats because, and we... And, and our sold. box office sells those tickets. I see. And, and, and if I've done, I've run the numbers, and if even 35% of our consignment tickets were sold through our box office, that 50% differential would go down to about 12.5%. So that's, that makes a huge difference. And that's um, edu education on our part, and it's understanding that all markets can, can find any sort of online outlet. So there's a lot of still education that we need to do in the community. And our stage crew is, uh, they are, uh, IATSE, is that the union? We are a non-union house. Um, we have three... Um, I shouldn't have said that. That's okay. We've, we've already dealt with I our union. I know what the next motion No, I know. <laughs> no, um, I have to be honest. About six years ago, IATSE <laughs> came in, and they looked at our books, and they came to the same conclusion that we did, that it would not be um, financially advantageous for them to come in and, and unionize our house. So... Um, so we did that analysis a while back, and, and the numbers haven't really changed significantly, so it shouldn't change that outcome. That being said, um, we do have full-time staff at the theater, um, what we call 30-hour-a-week guarantees, our technical director, our head sound engineer, our um, master electrician who handles all of our lighting, plus we have a full-time director of theater operations, house manager, and box office manager. All the other positions, ticket agents, front of house, concessions, on-call stage crew are all part-time and um, on-call at will. Okay. And how about concessions? Is that a significant... Uh, I know we've worked on that, and we talk about that as being... Uh, it's going to get better. Possible. So concessions is running um, roughly about a $35,000 profit um, in the last fiscal year. I think it was about 35000 in the last fiscal year. Um, this year, we're on track to do 45000 but sometime in the February-March period, we'll have an adjustment to our liquor license, we hope, um, that will allow us to expand our sales to spirits, which should increase our yield exponentially. 
exponentially. Don't say. Uh, I know. It's going to get even more fun to hang out at the Alex Theater. Um, so we'll increase our product line from there. When we took over our liquor license, um, I guess it was when I took over this position, so about three years ago, um, and started that operation, we went from $8,000 a year in, ticket, in uh, concessions revenue to now in our 30s. We expect with um, the the addition of spirits, that that would probably increase to at least 60 or 70. So, um, and, and again, the increased business from some of the local businesses and um, the additional support that we get from the Downtown Glendale Association is going to give us the opportunity to keep our forecourt open more often when we don't have performances and utilize that space um, in some fashion as a cafe or an outdoor music space in the spring. So we have grand ideas for some of those spaces as well. Okay, wonderful. Any other comments? Just a quick comment, uh, 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 Councilmember Sinaya. Uh, I assume that the construction that's going on in the general area, and specifically the construction that's going on next door at uh, Edenberger, is impacting you in, in one way or another. I assume it has, it has to be negatively. So it must be in Alex's interest for that construction to come to an end. Uh, am I correct on that? Well, we certainly want to see Edenburger open only because I want to eat Edenburger more often. <laughs> um, and, and certainly the construction has been a challenge. Um, I think the Lemley Lops project has been a challenge as well, although the developer has been very gracious and worked with our team um, very closely. Cassandra um, Pruitt from Economic Development has been a great liaison on that project. And whenever we've had challenges, we've been able to address them directly with the developer. Um, I think until those projects are, are completed to start any other major construction projects around the Alex might be a challenge for us, but certainly as long as we have as much information as we can provide our patrons and yeah. our promoters, we can work around those issues. We were able to make reasonable accommodations for some of our larger productions like Los Angeles Ball Ballet simply because we had enough lead time to work around some of the construction problems. Sure. I mean, you know, something like Eden Burger, I thought would be open by first quarter of this year. I think and they did too. Yeah, yeah, they did too. So <laughs> we've got to make sure that the city's cooperating with all these projects around there because I think they're hurting the overall health of uh, every other establishment in the area, including uh, Alex Theater. And, and, and I would, I absolutely agree with that. And I have to say that city staff has been incredibly responsive from Mr. Lands of Fame on down. Every time we've had a concern or an issue and it's been brought to their attention, they've been very responsive on both sides. So I think that city staff should be commended on that. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any other comments? Is there a motion to Move note and file? Second. And just to be clear, is this a council motion or a It is EDC? actually an Economic Development Corporation Okay. Motion. Okay, then let's uh, take roll then on this item. Board members Devine? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Garpedian? Yes. Sinanian? Yes. Chair Njarian? Yes. Thank you. Next item, please. Item two is Director of Community Development regarding Downtown Glendale Association Annual Work Plan Budget for the Downtown Glendale Community Benefit District for calendar year 2016. Two has a motion to accept Downtown Glendale Association 2016 budget. Mr. Ochoa. We have another brief report uh, that has to do with the annual work plan and budget for DGA, which is the property-based business improvement district. Uh, we'll have uh, Jackie come up and give a brief introduction and the principals from DGA are here if you have any specific questions, Jackie. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Um, today, you are being asked to consider and approve the 2016 budget for the Downtown Property-Based Community Benefit District, which will be presented by Marco Lamandry, the Executive Director of the Downtown Glendale Association. Mr. Lam Mr. Lamandry's presentation will be a brief overview of the past year and what is planned for the upcoming year. And with that, Mr. Lamandry. Hello. Thank you, Jackie. Hello. Um, thank you. There we go. So um, I'm sorry. This, do I just click it and it keeps going? Yes, just like a regular All right, mouse. thank you very much. So we wanted to give you an overview of the things that we've done, and we figured this would do it um, the best way 
in a short amount of time. So this is the district that we have right now. The shaded areas are not included in the district, and you see that it runs from Colorado up to the 134. All those parcels that are included are part of the Downtown Glendale Association. They pay approximately $900,000 a year in property assessments. Um, one thing that's unique about Glendale is that the noncompliance rate is extremely low. Uh, it's usually hovering around 1%. Other cities can be as high as 4%. So that's been very good. The city represents about $72,000 of those annual assessments to the DGA. This is the um, pie chart that shows you the allocation of services. The largest is the um, what's called SOBO, Sidewalk Operations Beautification and Order. It's what deals with everything within the public rights of way. The district identity uh, is also a, about 25, 20, 25%, and that deals with marketing promotion and anything that enhances the uh, image of the area. The total budget for 2015 was 1.132549 because we had a carry forward. That carry forward is shrinking a little bit each year because during the first year it took us a little while to get up to speed and get the service providers in place. So what you know that we've done the farmer's market, we moved it onto Brand Boulevard again and we're making our way trying to figure out the most effective times and the most effective population that we would be serving. We also uh, worked very closely with the Special Olympics and funded the events for the special um, uh, ce celebrations that they had at the Americana as well as at Perch. And you can see the, uh, that evening that we had the event at Perch, and it was very well attended. Um, you'll notice, too, as you're going throughout that we have our toy soldiers up, and we actually have uh, approximately 36 toy soldiers. We started that program last year and expanded it this year in order to get people into the holiday spirit. And you can see on the stars where all the holiday um, displays are throughout the district. We're now moving into more tables, chairs, and umbrellas. I have a, a final uh, picture at the end of the PowerPoint that shows that we're trying to enhance public seating. Uh, throughout the district, and we believe that since the boulevard is is growing so much, it's becoming so much more dense, people need a place to hang out and sit, and the, the more successful places in the country are ones with very good and dynamic public spaces. Can I ask a question? Sure. I've, we've had some complaints from some of the merchants on Maryland, who I think are in the uh, downtown Correct. merchants area, that they don't have any Christmas decorations. We concentrated on brand and particularly around the higher shopping areas. Uh, last year we had around 22. This year we had 36. Our, it's, it's our intention to put them all throughout the district. So is, is the – okay, well, that's good to hear. Has, has the Merchants Association sat down with all of the merchants? I mean, did, they seem blindsided by this. The, the folks on Maryland. And so I just want to make sure that as this kind of planning is done in the future, they have a chance to, you know, to kind of weigh in and have whatever vote they get to, you know, maybe as a group you can talk about where all those decorations go. And, you know, if we're not going to do it there, they should know that and understand the reason why, because they've been writing emails blaming the city for not giving uh, I've the seen decorations them, yes. without even seeming to know that we don't provide that, that it's provided, you know, by, by the association. Yeah, so, I read that one email and it's also mentioned more, the fire been a couple. department. So, um, yeah, but I've, I've only seen one, but okay. we, our staff is here every day. The maintenance guys are out here every day. The access to the DGA is completely transparent. So, we would encourage them. We have a district identity committee that, as you know, Helen has been the chair of that. And we try to recruit as many people as possible. They can help plan the events. Our budget for that this year was $180,000. So if they want us to do anything to bring attention to Maryland, we'd be more than happy to do that. So have you reached out to the folks who have complained or folk that have complained? And let we have them not reached out to them. because Invited them into the process? Uh, we have not done that at this point. We're just trying to figure out there were so many things in that email from that one long email that I really couldn't get my arms around it. So, but... We will take your lead and the suggestion and specifically reach out to that tenant. But all the tenants know who the DGA is. They see our maintenance guys all the time. So, um, and we would encourage that. We, we don't want to exclude anybody. And we, that's why we have this really good committee system to try to encourage people that might say that they have issues with you know, cleanliness or things that are obstacles. 
Uh, LA Fitness is setting up tents all up and down Brown Boulevard randomly right now, news racks that are empty. Those are issues that we are more than willing to deal with. We just need to get the communication through our maintenance crew or directly to our office. Okay, um, thank okay. You. thanks. Uh, can I ask, uh, do, do you have um, representation from the different areas of the downtown um, so that each one would have a representative at the table? In other words, you'd have one for Maryland, one for you know, uh, the 200 block, one for, you know, making sure that each section has representation. No, because the board and committees are open to anybody. So we don't designate that type of representation. We haven't divided up the no districts. districts. Per se. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no districts within the district. Yeah. <laughs> but we would really, we've been trying to get as many people as possible to work in our committees. And we're subject to the Brown Act. We're completely transparent on the allocation of funds. We just need people to say if they can't meet in the afternoon, can they meet at 8 o'clock in the morning? We'll accommodate that. So anybody that anyone on the city council knows that is interested, we'd be more than willing to accommodate them. If they can't attend one of our committee meetings that make the decision on the allocation of resources, then we'd be more than happy to take their input and bring it to that committee. And meeting. these emails go out to every single business that pays? Well, the property owners are the ones that pay. So one property uh, owner, for example, the Galleria has tons of tenants. Right. Well, as, as does the Americana. So it's the property owners that pay. But we believe that, of course, the tenants are the backbone of right. the entire district. And sometimes a property owner doesn't get to the tenant, correct? Correct. Right. So you can see that we try to do these displays to try to bring attention to things up and down Brand Boulevard. And, of course, we'll want to do that in Maryland and in Central and the other places, too, as we roll these things out. But we start them in one year, and then we try to roll them out in future years. But we've done this for the spring, and it was just a great, colorful display. Excuse me. Those were nice. They're fab. Thanks. We've had a lot of compliments on those. Now, I'm clicking, and I'm not clicking the right thing, so. Is there? Clark, can you? Go to, just click the right, uh, left button, left. Okay. Here, go to next right Here, there. Here, let me get you back on track. There you go. Okay, so these are other examples of us just putting those throughout the. Wrong, wrong one again. Um, just. Go to the left. Okay. The, ha the fall displays, uh, we've gotten so much great feedback on that. And again, we concentrated on Brand Boulevard because that's where most people see. Uh, but of course, we would be more than willing to spread that. This is a pretty inexpensive way to show the holiday seasons. And then our toy soldiers, as you s we are up to 36 now. We added, I think, 14 this year. And kids get involved, and they actually painted the boxes. We want to integrate the community as much as possible, whether they have parents that have businesses on Brown Boulevard or not. Uh, we've done a lot to try to integrate the schools into this entire program. And people love taking pictures next to these, too. So it's worked out really well. They're really sort of like uh, little stage sets. Um, our banners, we designed the banners and we put them up this year. And you can see all throughout the district, we've worked out with Jackie as to what months we have uh, access to the banners and we always have them during the holiday season. One of the things we've been working with on, on an ongoing basis is trying to deal with abandoned news racks because we don't believe they serve the interests of anybody, particularly the newspapers. So this is something that we'll continue to work with the city on to try to make sure that maybe they get concentrated down to two instead of four empty ones and two full ones. Uh, our ambassadors are actually guys that do everything between the curb and the property line. They do the sweeping, they do the power washing, they do the tree wash, excuse me, the uh, trimming and the uh, maintenance of the concrete planters, which you see in the background. They set up the Christmas displays, the fall displays, the spring displays. They do everything. They're kind of like mall management workers. They do the same thing a mall company would do. They sweep the sidewalks. And now we're working also with the city on looking at a demonstration block uh, on the replanting of trees. A lot of the trees on Bram Boulevard and other places are at the end of their life right now. And so we're trying to replace them, working with the city on that. Branding everything as much as we can on trash cans, branding things on the concrete planters. And as we look at 2016, we know that CBRE is moving into this building and it will be a great economic shot for that southern end, that part, the east side of Brand Boulevard, which has been a little uh, lacking over the last few years. It's been a gorgeous building. 
Uh, as you know, Caruso took it over. CBRE is moving in. There will be about 200 full-time employees working there. They're actually bringing 1,000 people from throughout the world. This is going to be the LA regional headquarters for CBRE. We think that they're going to be doing, buying a lot of Porto's bakery items and going up and down the street and patronizing all the um, restaurants and the retailers all throughout Brand Boulevard. So we see this as a real great economic shot in the arm. And that building's phenomenal and even more phenomenal that there's windows on the side of it. So um, it's, it's really something. <laughs> Uh, the Alex Theater, we're a great partner with uh, Aliza. She's a very strong member of our community, and we contribute every year um, to the Alex Theater and uh, help underwrite their events. And what they did this year in terms of relighting the neon was tremendous. And the night lighting on Brand Boulevard is beautiful. Uh, if you've seen this, I'm sure you have. Bloomingdale's light show is just really something magnificent. The Brandon Wilson sign is also really significant. And we think the more lighting and the more attraction and more color <coughs> on Brand Boulevard will serve everybody's interest. This is our map of public spaces, which we intend to go to uh, much more aggressively in 2016 and 2017, so people can just sit and relax all throughout Brand Boulevard, Maryland, Central, and other places all throughout the district. This was actually a private public space that was done, what we think was done in really good taste. It's not necessarily open to the public, but it is a good example of public space. The Neon Museum is about to come online. And we've done our part to try to make sure that uh, there's little tables and chairs for people to sit there. We'll also be working with this property owner to allow for public seating in this area, in this area, in Chess Park, and really trying to activate Chess Park. We put those lights up there to try to liven it up a little bit. In this area, there are tables and chairs there. And when it's not really windy, they work really well. But uh, sometimes, like yesterday, it got <laughs> extremely windy. And this is an example of those tables and chairs uh, right by California Pizza Kitchen and Tender Greens. So that's our overview. And every year we hope to do a little bit more and spread the, um, the resources a little bit more. We've got eight maintenance employees that we s provide services about 300 hours a week, pressure washing, landscaping, as well as the maintenance. And I think that people would agree that Brand Boulevard is in pretty good shape. And it's our uh, desire, working with the city manager, working with Phil, who's on our board, and Jackie, to try to up the game and up the game and up the, to make this really one of the more significant walkable retail corridors uh, in all of L.A. County. Okay, questions? Um, Maybe a comment. <clears throat> Not so much of a question. Uh, I want to go back to Maryland. I agree with uh, Council Member Friedman. Uh, there is an interest, at least from couple of the council members up here uh, to turn Maryland into a very hot, pedestrian-friendly environment. And first money I get, I would put in there. I would bet my money on Maryland as well. So, uh, and that's between CBRE and Alex. And it's closer to CBRE and Alex to, to anything else. And I think, I'm not saying neglecting, but I think we can't just discount Maryland. And uh, if the property owners pay the same uh, fees as the rest of the Brand Boulevard property owners. I think we need to pay just a little bit more attention to Maryland as well. As far as, especially in this time, they have, we have a lot of merchants on, from Harvard to Wilson, especially, and uh, they, they are hurting and they need help. I mean, I think and that's an, a close extension of the downtown. And it would be a very hip area, I promise you that, because I would, again, I would bet my money on that. But, uh, I, I, my suggestion is just a friendly suggestion to, to pay more attention to it because they need the same kind of services and uh, you know, attention as the rest of the... The rates are a little bit higher on Brown Boulevard, but I agree, Maryland's the most walkable street, really, and it's the most intimate street in the entire downtown area. There's no disagreement whatsoever. You know, the, the ingress and egress of the parking <clears throat> structure sort of... Um, makes it a little bit more challenging to make it walkable because there's so many cars going in and out of that parking structure. I, I, I don't know. I, I respectfully disagree because people who come out of those parking structures, they walk on Maryland. So they park there and they come out. I know they, they have a choice of getting exit right. from the alley side. I never take the alley side. I always take the Maryland side because it's more pleasant and you don't have to walk by the, uh, the trash containers. The yeah, alley. The, so, the alley is actually a very interesting and a potential site, too. It is. It for is. walkability. So, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so totally, I totally agree, and I will ensure that 
we put far more emphasis in 2016 on Maryland. Because I, I think it's a very good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Sinanyan, are you, uh, I can't see your hands if you're waving them, but do you have any comments? No, I mean. Uh, uh, yeah, I would uh, like, uh, I, I would I like to add on to Council Member Garpetin's comments about Maryland. That I mean, pretty much since the day I got elected, it, it's been my vision to open, you know, close down two blocks of Maryland, uh, the Wilson and Broadway blocks of Maryland, all the way to the library to traffic and open it to, um, to pedestrians and turn it into a sort of a meaningful pedestrian promenade. For our residents and for for guests, the issue with the the entry of the cars to the parking lots, I think that's been discussed with staff. It's just a matter of money for us to make sure that all the entrances are off of Maryland. And it's been my understanding that when the federal monies that are owed to us um, as a result of the dissolution of the um, redevelopment agency, when those monies finally come home where they belong, um, I'm going to, you know, raise the issue of using part part of those funds to make Maryland into a pedestrian promenade. Uh, so going back to the main issue at hand, uh, I do agree that Maryland should get the same treatment as any other, um, the businesses on Maryland should get the same treatment as the businesses on Brand because in essence it is, it is part of downtown and those businesses are just as interested and as engaged and, and as um, uh, as vested in the success of the downtown business district as as those on brand <clears throat> well, let me ask a question and then yes. I'll, I'll go to miss Reed. so how are the big um, so the big participants of the uh, business district are the Galleria and Caruso affiliated and the city? Raul, Raul Poor has been on our board since the beginning, too, though. I'm talking about in terms of actual cash yeah. in it would assessment. Be, I think it's Galleria, Caruso, and the city in that order. Okay. So, how does the Galleria feel about participating? Do they feel that it's worth their, their contribution? How does Caruso Affiliated feel? What sort of sense do you get from them? You hear, uh, you hear what the city. The city's view is, but we're partners in this Correct. endeavor. What what do your other partners do? Our other partners feel about this? Well, the um, Galleria has had sporadic contribute or sp sporadic involvement, but now Brent Gardner, who's the new general manager of the Galleria, is an active member of our board and probably be heading up one of our committees. So Galleria always thought that the entire intent of the district was to try to make it seamless. So whether you're at the Gallery or the Americana or going up and down Brand Boulevard, it's all one big shopping district. That's now evolving into a residential district, too. So they've been extremely positive. As you know, the president is Rick Lemo from Caruso. So Caruso has always been part of this thing. So I think that their view is that things are very positive. They want to move forward. And we're just trying to take a lot of the critical mass that exists in those two places and bring them up. And I think that you're seeing a lot of the new developments, particularly on the west side of Brand Boulevard uh, by Central, the new residential developments, which I, is not, they're not part of the district at this point, but they're going to change the whole dynamic of the district. It's going to be far more walkable, far more exciting, and put a whole new demand on retail that currently doesn't exist. So I think they're pleased with the success of the district okay. thus far. I know Rick Lemo isn't one to be pleased easy. He, he we know that has well. an opinion that's, <laughs> you know, somewhat uh, terse. But uh, I don't see him here today. I think he's uh, unavailable. Yeah, he's uh, taking some time off in December. So I told okay. him that I would handle this. So well, you tell him that uh, that you did a good job, and that uh, it's just not the same hearing without. <laughs> without Rick huffing and puffing and yes, and giving it a little bit back to us. Yes. Uh, and I know if he was here, he would be giving it back to us. But the important thing, uh, you know, everything being said, is that our partners are happy with the results, that the, uh, the city is generally happy, and we have the comments to focus on Maryland, which I think is a great potential uh, to improve the entire district. Agree. Um, and to keep doing uh, what you're doing. So let's go. And to I, if I may say, I think city manager knows, and I know you've been speaking at the BizNow conferences, and there's just so much attention right now 
that's on Brand Boulevard in Glendale. So I think that all these forces are all coming. The timing's great for doing all this. The CBRE is just another brick in the wall that's starting to build this into a really solid shopping district. Very good. What's happening on Brand is very exciting. And I love driving down Brand and seeing people on the street at 9 and 10 o'clock. And you never saw that even seven, eight years ago. Um, so this is a wonderful evolution to have this association now um, really uniting the property owners and the merchants in the downtown and w the work with the ambassadors and the amenities that you're providing, the flowers, the, all of the holiday decorations. is um, It's really been improving the downtown. It's very noticeable. Uh, and I just wanted to call out particularly your new initiative to increase the seating yes. and public resting spaces and places for people to sit and eat food that they take out. That is a really key piece that's been missing. Uh, well, not missing. I think that the demand wasn't there before. Now we have the demand, and you're seeing that demand and filling that need. And that's something else that's going to be a, a very needed and very key amenity. So I wanted to single that out to, con to commend you on that, but also to encourage you to keep pushing that further. Uh, we need to do more as we allow, if, if more projects come online, to make sure that we have public accessible open space that has some sort of programming and what you're doing is filling in the gaps of some of those older buildings like the building with California Pizza Kitchen right. it has a huge plaza but it's never been programmed exactly. very it's well not at activated all. at all and if they're right. not going to put money into redoing it and reprogramming it and putting in landscaping and putting in permanent seating the next best thing is what you're doing so as you do that besides tables and chairs I hope you do look at temporary landscaping and I would urge you to look at what's been done in Times Square in New York as a model because they've taken over a lot of what used to be road space and blocked them off and put in temporary, well, not a temporary anymore, they were supposed permanent. to be temporary, now they're permanent, right. but not just table and chairs, but entire environments that they created to make those tables and chairs much more um, appealing to people and to feel less temporary and to feel like something that's supposed to be there and part of the landscape right. and something that now has become a signature of Times Square, as much as the the the, the crawl going around with the stock market, uh, people take photos of of those seating areas. So, please think of them even more holistically. And if and if we can help you, and I would say this to city staff, if we can help you with some more resources to make those larger areas like the California Pizza Plaza, and I don't know what the name of the building is, forgive me. Or and outside address. of specialties up on the northern end on the east side. Yeah, too. so you know, I, I think I'd be willing to us look at economic development dollars or look at whatever dollars we have somewhere to help put something in that's special beyond tables and chairs to make interesting environments that people talk about and people right. take pictures of. You know, it's actually Mayor Bloomberg that did that all up and down Broadway from Columbus Circle all the way down to downtown where they vacated streets all throughout and it's just been a wonderful addition people said it would never work and it works wonderfully and that's where one place where mayor najarian and i can agree that astroturf might be a fun thing to have in certain places that's what they did in new york in the street and they they did blue ones and they did different colors to to make them uh, yeah, to be it's, it's a wonderful exciting. model and I, w I would just say too that you know i mentioned a lot that Amazon's turning retail on its head right now, everywhere. You know, big department stores that were never supposed to be hurt are being hurt. But down to, people are coming to downtowns for social interaction, not just for shopping. And so the public space element is critical to that. They might just want to go down with no agenda whatsoever and meet people and have coffee or do whatever. You know, you can get on your cell phone or your smartphone and talk throughout the world. So this is what we're trying to do. This is our model. And again, to go back to, uh, to Maryland, Maryland is probably the best street to do that on. And just to that end, maybe you can even partner with Bloomingdale's and Nordstrom's and those big retailers to help you do displays in those public spaces that they can help sponsor, but then maybe promote whatever special thing they're doing right. in their yeah. establishments at that time. And we have a, I, we're very, very fortunate that the city council, city manager, and staff are so open to all this because a lot of cities aren't. But this is, you know, we have our own corporation, which is 501c3, working with the city on this. It, there's no reason why we can't move forward very, very quickly. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Devine. Yeah, very quickly. Um, I want to go back to the ambassadors. Um, are they equipped with maps of downtown Glendale, the restaurants, the streets, et cetera, the shopping? 
to give to visitors to our city because I know sometimes we've been stopped and you know asked where something is also a good place to put you know Maryland on the map and the restaurants that they have there that's I don't think we have that or we do have that Nick in terms of um, what is it a brochure okay so restaurants restaurants and gyms Uh, and the ambassadors are there handing those out? They Every ambassador them? would have that on, on their yes. part. Okay, great. Uh, one thing that we've done, too, in, in other districts is sometimes there's so much, so it's hard to put every single restaurant. So we do is like all the restaurants are red dots, mm -hmm. and all the retailers might be blue dots. And someone looks at it, and they just see from the dots where the critical mass is of different places. And those are little handouts that are on cardstock, too, and it leads them to different areas. A lot of the office buildings might have retail on the bottom, but upstairs that they're primarily offices. But people always migrate to where there's the most activity like right. that. So that's something that we should be doing. We have it in our budget to mm -hmm. do that, too. Good. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Any closing? Uh, are you uh, you're all set, Mr. Sinanyan? Anything else? Okay. I'll... I'll yes, start. I am. I'm, every, I'm okay. set. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Then we have a uh, motion to accept the budget at 2A. Would someone like to make that? I'll motion? move the item. Second. Yes, Roll call, please. Council members Devine? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Darpedian? Yes. Sinanian? Yes. Aaron Najarian? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Best for the holidays. Thank you. To you. Thank you. Next item, please. Item three is Director of Community Development regarding exclusive negotiating agreement with R3 Real Estate Developers LLC for the potential ground lease of city owned parking lot number three for development of Hotel Indigo. 3A is the City Council motion authorizing economic development staff to complete negotiations of an exclusive negotiating agreement with R3 Real Estate Developers LLC R3 for the purposes of entering into ground lease of city owned parking lot number three. Uh, APNs 5642-016-902-5642-016903-5642-016904-5642-016905-and 5642-016906 5642 for the potential development of a hotel indigo and authorizing city manager to execute the same. Mr. Ochoa. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so often we do uh, economic development presentations and oftentimes the projects take uh, many years, uh, sometimes even decades, to come to fruition. I'm very pleased to present to you this item uh, that really is, uh, in, in earnest, only a couple of years in the making, uh, beginning with uh, the, the uh, council's trip to, and specifically Councilman, uh, then Mayor uh, Sinanian, to go along with staff to uh, ICSE, followed up by this year's uh, trip to ICSE both with uh, Councilman Sinanian and Councilman Garpetian, uh, because what we wanted to have uh, another amenity in, in downtown as a boutique hotel. So with that as a setup, let me have our Principal Economic Development uh, Officer Darlene come forward and provide you with some very exciting information regarding Hotel Indigo. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, this report dovetails nicely into all the wonderful things you've heard this afternoon about Brand and the Alex Theater. The item before you is a request for an exclusive negotiating agreement for, for the purpose of negotiating a ground lease of city-owned parking lot number three for the development of a 130-room Hotel Indigo. As Mr. Ochoa said, hotel development has been a strong part of Glendale's attraction and recruitment efforts for downtown Glendale. In 2014, a team of economic development staff members, along with Councilmember Sinanian, attended the ICSC conference to meet and recruit hotel industry leaders. The conference has over 70,000 uh, members and is the premier global trade association for the shopping center industry. And again, adding to this earlier this year, Councilmember Sinanian and Councilmember Garpedian attended this conference again to meet with industry leaders and reinforce Glendale's strategic location and our continued growth as a visitor destination. We met with representatives of various hotels, one of them being the Intercontinental Hotels Group, or what's uh, the acronym is IHG. IHG responded favorably to the concept of a boutique operation in Glendale and started to look Glendale uh, very closely uh, to assess our marketplace. At this time, the city also engaged in a draft study of the hotel market for this region, um, and IHG was convinced that Glendale was a strong market, and they came knocking on our door. 
Here to give you a little background on IHG's brand, um, they are an international hotel company with more than 4,900 hotels in 100 countries. As you can see from this slide, they offer an array of products to fit the needs of different travelers and visitors. When they toured downtown Glendale, they thought the product that best fit Glendale and our needs would be a Hotel Indigo. Hotel Indigo focuses on creating a unique boutique atmosphere designed specifically for the neighborhoods that they're located in. Here um, I've added some exterior pictures of Hotel Indigos, both local and some international photos. Here um, you'll see some interior photographs of Hotel Indigos. As you can see, they really focus on color and create a very vibrant atmosphere. Uh, these rooftop shots show you different things that can be done in different hotels. Um, what would be done in Glendale um, could have elements of what you see here, but what's very clear is it would be tailored to Glendale. As part of IHG's business model, they focus on managing and franchising their hotels while their preferred developers own the actual hotel. IHG has confirmed to the city in writing that R3 Real Estate Developers is their preferred developer for this region. They've also confirmed in writing um, that they like this uh, proposed city site for a Hotel Indigo. R3 is an experienced hotel developer and operator. They have 17 hotels throughout the LA and Orange County region and they've built a previous IHG uh, products. This would be their fourth IHG product. This map um, will show you the location we're discussing in relation to all of downtown. As you can see, it's on the southwest corner of Maryland and California in the mid-brand area. This is a closer shot. Um, it's improved with 65 parking spaces in the lot behind 24-hour fitness and Goodwill. To give you a little, uh, some of these business terms, um, when we look at an exclusive negotiating agreement on this site, what it does is it allows Hotel Indigo's developer, which is R3, the ability to conduct due diligence. Um, we're going to look at the developability of this site and its project. It's a non-binding agreement, 180 days. You look at feasibility, you do due diligence. Um, and with that, they'd also have to provide a number of things to this. There's an economic feasibility component to it. Um, also, um, some more developed plans is what they'd have to provide us. Um, during the term, the developer will also, um, we'll, we'll negotiate in good faith with the developer. Um, we would come up with those pricing terms, again, those specific design plans. One thing that we have told them again and again is this is an asset that we currently use for public parking. Any type of development contemplated on this site would have to replace that public parking. And of course, it would have to be a boutique hotel operator and a branded one at that. Um, here, uh, I'm going to show you the rendering. Um, R3 has engaged with a local architect, um, very local, R. Malajajian, and he has provided some very preliminary drawings. And these were things that would be developed as we go through this ENA process, but they wanted to give us a sense of what this could look like. This is a day rendering here as well as a night rendering. And I should point out at this point that R3's principal, Mr. Patel, he is unavailable to be here. He had a family medical emergency. Um, however, Mr. Alajajian uh, is here in the audience if you have specific questions about the project. Yes. And then the last photo here is some uh, proposed outdoor restaurant seating that would be located on the first floor. Um, so as you can see, this really does add to that eco economic vibrancy we've talked about this afternoon. Um, with that, that concludes my report, and I'm available to answer any questions that you might have about this. Okay. No, this is from, uh, this is not from this. I don't, so I don't have any cards. If uh, okay. my colleagues want to jump in, uh, we'll go to Mr. Garbetian. I have a couple of questions, but comments. Uh, we want this hotel built. We don't want it to be dragged, no offense to the architect or the, the Mr. Patel. Uh, I just want to make sure that I have no issue of 180 days of uh, ENA. I just want to make sure this, is, this will be a, a, an Indigo Hotel. It won't change into a Holiday Inn Express or something like that. And it will, be, it will not be flipped to somebody else. That, that, that new owner is going to be uh, dragging it for another two, three years, four years. I know that the intention is to get this thing done as soon as possible and build it. But I want to make sure that 
when we, we are negotiating, that be part of our, our negotiation too, to make sure this will be an Indigo Hotel and nothing else, because that's what we went after and that's what they came after us for, and they approved the site. And also, uh, if the economics doesn't work in, in three months and they say, you know, it won't work this way, so be it. But I just want to make sure that we, we just indicate in our, in our uh, ENA that it's Indigo Hotel and it will be built by this developer. That's all. If that is the council's direction in terms of uh, what ultimately will be a business term in a development agreement that would supersede and follow the ENA, then a covenant perhaps, and I would defer to the city attorney, that would restrict the uh, type of product that could in some eventuality uh, replace Indigo. It has to, I, in other words, it would have to be a boutique product as opposed to some of the other products that you uh, had identified. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Sinanya? Um, yeah, I, I'm just I'm happy that we're coming to this point where a boutique hotel, which we had shortlisted earlier on as, as one of the potential best fits for downtown Glendale is um, you know is coming to the point where we're starting negotiations and I'm, I'm trying to understand the uh, council member Garpetin's comments perhaps it's motivated by previous history where um, I, I guess promises have been made of five-star hotels coming to downtown Glendale and then they've, they've fallen through I, I understand something like of that nature has happened in the past and uh, my understanding initially, and, and at all times, has been that Indigo is the hotel that we're negotiating with, and Indigo is the hotel that's going to uh, be built in Glendale, and no other, no other hotel. If it's another hotel, I guess we'll have to go through another process. But um, I, so what I'm saying is that, yes, it does have to be Indigo, and, and yes, we are going with this developer because of their special relationship with Intercontinental. That's what Intercontinental told us in Vegas. They said we have, you know, authorized developers in geographic areas, and we only stick to them. So this is the developer for this area. Um, the the architectural rendering, I I like it. I think it's um, it goes along with the development that that's that's been happening in downtown Glendale in terms of um, its style. So I'm sure during the negotiating process, some refinements will be made. That's only natural. That's what the negotiation is partially for. And um, I look forward to seeing the results and having a modern, hip boutique hotel in downtown Glendale. Ms. Devine? Comment. Um, just a comment. I, I know that our ultimate goal is to get a five-star hotel here in Glendale, and hopefully that will happen. But this is a, a great way to begin uh, to get a very nice uh, three-star boutique hotel uh, in our city. It looks like it will uh, be very um, uh, um, kind of uh, suited uh, for travelers and, and young people as well that uh, might come to our city. Be a shot in the arm for Maryland. We're talking about that, and and here it is. Um, so uh, I'm also in favor of uh, of this project. I think it's uh, it's a great opportunity. Ms. Friedman, I'm in favor of the project. Uh, having tried to find hotels for my parents when they've come, uh, it's very limited. And there's been some times when they've come here and not been able to get a room at the Hilton or the. Um, uh, embassy suites because of events in you know the Rose Bowl or other places so to have another hotel that's at a higher price point but not an outrageous price point is going to serve a very good need here in Glendale and I, I think it will be very successful uh, is this project going to be a prevailing wage project given that it's on public property um, Members of the City Council, uh, and it, it, I don't believe so at this point. Now, obviously, we're negotiating the terms of a potential ground lease and the terms of an ENA, but uh, at this point, there's no consideration for a write-down of a lease payment or uh, fees or other uh, contributions that would trigger prevailing wage as a, as a publicly assisted project. So the answer would be not at this point, but typically um, the construction trades that are involved with a developing hotel are, for the most part, uh, union, union labor. Okay. I'd like to make sure that this is done as a PLA union project. Um, I don't want to see them 
having a strike the way that the Hilton had several years ago, and I think it's uh, good for um, for us for many reasons. So can we at least move forward with negotiating that with them and bring back a report uh, down the road to if, council? If the direction if the direction is uh, to include that as an item to be explored as part of the ENA, then if that's the council's direction, we would include that understanding that it may or may not be part of the ultimate development agreement pending the how the negotiations play out. Well, before we say no, I'd like that to come back to council before we say close that door, in other words. I'd like us to, to open that door and explore that. Well, if you gave us direction now, we could begin that negotiation as part of the ENA yes. along with the rest of it. Exactly. Well, I would need direction from council. Well, my thoughts are let's find out if uh, if, an, if a PLA, and of course, when you say PLA, there's a lot to a PLA. The PLA itself has to be negotiated. Correct. Uh, let's find out if that is going to be a deal killer, because I think the primary focus that I have is that this be constructed, uh, as my colleagues have, uh, have recommended, that it be an indigo, that it be done forthwith. Um, yeah, let's explore that. And let's see. see if that's going to be prohibitive uh, in this context. In the context of the ENA? Yes. Okay. All right. If I, if I may add something, Mr. Mayor, I mean, we, I think we were talking about broaching the subject of PLAs in general, but that never really uh, came to council. So let, why don't we just move forward with the negotiations? And that can be one of the things that can be negotiated. But unless and until the council takes a position on PLAs, I don't want to make it a precondition for this project. Yeah, we're not making a precondition for this project. That that would be part of the the ENA to be negotiated, and that's up to the uh, developers if they if they wanted to go to that route. And as it was indicated, most of the developers, most of their their subs are union members, anyways, building hotels. But it has to be part of the negotiation, and it has to make economic sense. Okay, and um, you know. Just so we're on the same page, PLO is, PLA is not solely um, requiring union labor. There's a lot of other things. There's apprenticeship programs. There's local <coughs> hire programs, uh, DBE, uh, disadvantaged business hiring, minority business hiring, women business hiring. So there's a lot in that, and I, I, think, uh, I think we should go forward. The strike at the Hilton, though, was not... Regarding its construction, that right. was right. Right. that was something different. Well, let's right. let's find out if they will be using uh, union labor as well, whether there's a PLA or not. And I know Mr. Patel um, was referred through the Indigo as one of his preferred workers. I you know I met him about eight years ago uh, when he was expressing an interest in developing a boutique hotel. Uh, the economic climate and the uh, the climate of the, the city manager was not such that we were ready to have him at that point. But I'm glad that he stuck it out and, uh, you know, we saw his portfolio of holdings and managing uh, properties uh, and they were quite, quite acceptable. So I'm glad we, our paths crossed again with my colleagues um, at the ICE, uh, ICSE. ICSC. ICSC. I call it the Vegas Convention. Uh, <laughs> Well, worked out that it was a fortuitous meeting and that we're moving forward. So we have a motion to authorize economic I'll development. The item. Second. Roll call, please. Council members Devine? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Garpedian? Yes. Sananian? Yes. Aaron Najarian? Yes. Would someone like to adjourn for the council? So moved. Second. And would someone like to move for the EDC? So moved. Second. We are adjourned. We have closed session? Yes, we do. Okay, let's take roll call for the council. And just for the
When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move, so I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day, I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. You're doing great. Let's just, we're going to try this again, okay? Okay. Wheels, pedals, handlebar, brakes. Sit up straight, keep your weight in the center, keep your eyes on the road, hands on the grips, button the seat. If we feel ourselves falling, what do we do? Just, just keep pedaling. Good girl. Now remember, it's all about balance and steering. Steer with your hands, steer with your body. Steer into the corners and you stay out of trouble. And the bell's your buddy, so go ahead and ding that. All right, you ready? Here we go. Pedal, honey, pedal. There you go, you're a bike rider. Most parenting is hard to do in just two minutes. But two minutes twice a day making sure they brush is easier, and it could help save them from a lifetime of tooth pain. Hey Glendale, you've assembled your disaster kit and are prepared in the event of an emergency. But have you left anyone important out of your plan? Don't forget the animals in your life. In the event of an emergency, your faithful furry or scaly companions will be relying on you. Let's get the ball rolling. Your animal will need supplies such as food and water, medications and veterinary records, sturdy leashes, harnesses and carriers, current photos of your pets, pet beds and toys that are easy to transport. Travel may be limited in the event of an emergency. Make a list of options for shelters and accommodations. Our animal friends come in all shapes and sizes. Think about the special needs and concerns for yours. Disasters and evacuations are unpredictable in nature, so be sure to plan beforehand. 
The City of Glendale wants to make sure you're prepared. For more info, go to the City of Glendale Pet Preparedness link. Happy holidays, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Dog House, the City of Glendale's Pet Adoption Show. I'm Kevin McManus of the Pasadena Humane Society. To my right, Dottie Sharkey from the City of Glendale Parks and Open Spaces Foundation. Dottie, good. happy holidays. Good How are job. you? Doing great, Kevin. Thanks. Good, good. I'm yeah. glad to have you here with us. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> Private joke. <laughs> I was a little late. So. Dottie's on, I don't know, so not even central okay. time. Uh, Long um, story, I'm but in, anyway, we're I'm here now, <laughs> and we've got some great pets to show you today um, who would love to be adopted for the holidays. Uh, before we do that, we're going to show you um, an update of the pets. So uh, still quite a few available, but that's okay. I think, you know, in the next couple of days, they'll oh, yeah. be moving out quickly. Right? I believe so. so. Yeah, we've got some great, great things going on here yeah. to, for adoptions. Well, let's uh, start right into the pets for this week. And as usual, we're starting with a small furry thing. And our volunteer, Andrea, is bringing out a lovely rabbit named Spock. How'd you get the name Spock? Um, Spock. Uh, oh. <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> She's always going like this. Oh, okay. Wait, that's not vulgar. Anyway, no. Spock's ID number is A383710. Sorry, Star Trek fans. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, she's actually an adult female, about one year old rabbit. Um, gray and white, beautiful, short hair. Um, she is very social, enjoys having her nose and ears gently rubbed. Um, oh. And she's yeah, really friendly and really, really sweet. Loves just hanging out with people. She's obviously been like this. Um, spent a lot of time just relaxing in people's laps. So she's very comfortable with that. She is. Just isn't she sweet? It's like this is where she belongs. Yeah. And Spock's adoption fee is fifteen dollars. Um, she is, as I said, already spayed. So we, of course, for our rabbits as well, implant microchips in case they are mm -hmm. to get lost. So, um, but she's ready to go. She's a real. She's a love. She's so soft. I love this. <laughs> She's perfect. Just perfect. Yeah. She is so settled. I know. I mean, yeah. and this is the great thing about, you know, so many of the rabbits here where they, they're just so comfortable with people. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking, I mean, obviously a rabbit is quite a bit of work, much more so mm -hmm. than um, a lot of people think. But, you know, it's always great to have a rabbit who's been around people, mm -hmm. who's comfortable. Um, because if you have, you know, kids or something and they want mm -hmm. to spend time with a bunny, it's, mm -hmm. it, you know, to not have... You know, the rabbit squirming to get away from you. Yeah. It's really, it's nice. And Spock, you are just a little love. You are. Do we have a good shot of Spock? I like her a little there bit. There you go. Like so Spock's ID number again is A3738310. All right. Well, let's bring out a beautiful cat. And uh, volunteer Aww. Judy is bringing in lovely Betty White. Um, who She's is a happy cat. A sweet, sweet cat. Her ID number is A389108. Uh, Betty is actually a 15-year-old, no. approximately, uh, spayed female. Are um, you really? Uh, what we call a tortie point Siamese, which is you know, just a beautiful coloration Aww. pattern. Um, mo like most other senior pets, she's very calm and relaxed. She really just wants to have a nice warm lap to hang out yeah. and sleep and, you know, take naps. But 
Um, Betty. She's purring. I oh, yeah, love no, she's this. A, what a, a love. And what a love. Is she playful still? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, she's still, uh, still got some spunk, Miss White. She sure she, does. Like her namesake. Um, so Betty um, is available for adoption now. Her adoption fee is $70, but she is certainly eligible for our Senior for Senior mm -hmm. program for any adopter over the age of 60. Her adoption fee uh, is only twenty dollars, and that covers the microchip registration. She's a love. She's really a just friendly, a beautiful very cat. special. And, oh. and this is the time of year that we add a little more in doing special things. And how about for Betty White? Adopt Miss Betty White. Betty White, White what, a, what a beautiful gift! <laughs> what a beautiful gift! And she's so happy. Yeah. You know, she doesn't. And, you know, 15 is obviously our estimate, but, you know, she's still very active and still friendly and, and outgoing. And so, you know, she could be with us yeah. for another five, six years, maybe. Well, Disney's just had a big celebration for Dick Van Dyke in 90, and he's just spunky. And that's yeah, you, too, huh? Along well. so, yeah, so animals are the same way. <laughs> Let me give you Betty's uh, You're number You're just going to be hopping all over the place. <laughs> it's A389108, Miss Betty White. All right, let's bring out our second cat, and this is another lovely senior cat. Um, this is Jade, A362812. Um, Jade is an 11-year-old spade female. Um, she's a long-haired, kind of black, smoky, mm -hmm. um, beautiful, lovely cat. She uh, is confident and social, um, and very strong. active. And <laughs> strong. She is well, I, pulling. I like, was uh, just about to say that yeah, she's very she's, active for yeah. her age, so she definitely so. wants to be out exploring instead and of hanging out with us right now. These two cats are pretty healthy that we've had. Uh, they can go well into their 20s. Absolutely. So. Um, she you are spunky. absolutely loves attention. Uh, she's very friendly with our staff and volunteers. Um, and like Betty White before, her adoption fee is $70, but would be reduced as part of the Senior for Senior program. So, so you are free except for the microchip right. if Any adopter somebody's over 60. Over 60. So. Uh -huh. so I just love this, you know, kind mm -hmm. of like, I mean, it, it almost like changes yeah. colors the way you, different, you know, yeah. different angles. And we already know she's just a great cat, mm -hmm. you know, summer. And so, cats are the same, but they're different. You know, I have two cats, and so different, so different. So I'm when you get two an, cats, who are also very different. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what? What I mean is, she's just a wonderful cat. Mm -hmm. You know, you already know she's gentle, and both cats so far have been purring, yes. and that doesn't happen all the time. So yeah. yes, yeah, you are ones. very, very special. Well, let's give so. Jade's ID number again. It is A362812, 11-year-old Jade. December 22nd is the first official day of winter. As temperatures start to get a little colder, it's important to keep some few things in mind in regards to our pets as well as other animals in our community. We all know never to leave a pet in a car, especially on a hot day. The same goes for cold weather. Cold cars also pose significant risk to your pet's health. Try to limit time spent in the car to only that which is necessary and never leave your pet unattended in a vehicle. Always be sure to have a comfortable place indoors for your cat or dog to sleep and stay warm. And if your dog has a short coat or seems bothered by colder weather, try getting your dog a sweater or a coat. Sometimes cats, especially feral cats, will seek out warm vehicle engines to stay warm on cold nights. Before you start your car engine in the morning, be sure to check underneath the car and knock on the hood before starting the engine. So these are some helpful tips that I hope we all will follow in this cold climate. All right, let's bring out our third and final cat for today, and this is um, a, a little scaredy. Um, this is Fifi, whose ID number Fifi, is A385703. Okay. Got her? Hi, Fifi. It's all right. It's love. okay, sweetie. She's stuck on my back here. I know she is. And this is Judy, our volunteer, who does a <laughs> great job of wrangling our Look, cats. She's got, she's got a claw caught on. 
<laughs> and keeping them nice and calm while we get them ready for the show. Claws so. happen. Judy's wonderful. Wait, so, no. There we go. There we go. All so, right. Judy Thank had Judy. more than All her dislodged. 15 seconds. Uh, well, let's talk <laughs> Thank about you, Judy. Fifi. She's okay. Fifi's Aww. ID number is A385703. She's a 10 year old female, also spayed and ready to go home today. Um, brown tabby, beautiful white markings. I love tabbies. I say that all the time. I get I a tabby and I, they're so wonderful. They're um, just, and Fifi, just so once she's relaxed and gets to know you, is super friendly, mm -hmm. likes to snuggle on your lap. Um, and, you know, she definitely wants, you know, the kind of the lights and mm -hmm. bustle and everything are, uh, are settled down. She's going to be fantastic. Um, she's probably. Uh, one of the nicest cats that we have. And really? she's also um, another one of our senior cats. So her adoption fee, mm -hmm. same as the last two, would be um, $70 normal adoption mm -hmm. fee or uh, 20 if the adopter is over 60 And as I mentioned, with the last cat, they can be very, they can t live quite a long time, yeah. you know, into their 20s. Absolutely. And, and uh, we've had three older cats here, but they've been pretty healthy. And, Right, and you know, one of the parts of the, our assessment is always to do a health evaluation. Mm -hmm. So we don't want any surprises. We don't want uh, you know the adopter to be surprised mm -hmm. at all. So a shy attack. Oh, don't you love Fifi, that? That okay, is so love. sweet. That is so it's sweet. Right. Oh. Kevin will pet you. Well, let me so. give you Fifi's ID number again. It is a three eight five seven zero three. Lovely and shy but sweet Fifi. And she's purring. Of course she yes. is. Yes. Yes. Okay, let's have our first dog. This is Celine. Come out here. Oh, Come you're here, so love. cute. <laughs> Celine's Hi. number is Come A382166. Here. Yes. And how old are Celine you? Celine is a six year old oh, you're six. female um, pit bull mix, obviously. Um, uh, doing, getting a history lesson of everything that just <laughs> happened. Dogs do that with their oh, noses. Celine. Come here, love. So, oh. Celine is. Uh, you know, an active dog, full of energy, super Aww. playful. Um, and she, despite being six, um, well, you smelling all those because cats? she's six, she's available for our senior for senior oh, adoption okay. fee. But if the adopter is under 60, then um, she's only $100 because she's one of our many blue ribbon winning dogs. Wow. So, um, and you know, one of those things that we really like to highlight are dogs like Celine who know mm -hmm. a bunch of commands. So she knows sit down, stay, come when called, sort of. Uh, uh, but she's, yeah, very, fl yeah. Uh, just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have some really great video, I think, on our website of her just kind of running around, oh. just being a sweet, mm -hmm. sweet dog. And um, Celine is actually the longest resident for some reason. She's been here for a couple months now. Um, oh. But she's ready now. She's, she would like to be home for the holidays. Yeah, and we think she's, yeah. uh, she's pretty good with most other dogs, obviously she's part of the process. She's such a love. Oh, yeah. I just, so hot of I, And that's what is, you know, kind of mind-boggling yeah. for us. I think, mm -hmm. you know, she's... She is you? so sweet. She's one of my yeah. favorites. I'll really? Have yeah. She's, well, look how she came over to me right away. Yeah. Of course, she's smelling all cats and rabbits. And <laughs> But Everything very that friendly, else. very oh, well trained. Yeah. So we really yeah. like her. Yeah, with that little nose, she knows everything that just happened before she got <laughs> here. <laughs> so, yes, and it, it's well, pretty interesting, isn't it? Huh? A lot so happened we, here. We can't let you go under the table. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so, and, and she's not a lap dog, is she? Sometimes Kevin, <laughs> sometimes Kevin will get these really large dogs and they want to be lap dogs. Well, and, and you're so good. You're so good about it. I have it. a big lap. You do. You do. So, all right. Let me give your number again, and we have to get you a home. This is ridiculous. So you have to start locking eyes with people when they walk in. Girl. You know, that's the trick. You lock, you lock eyes. Don't let them go by. So, again, this is Celine, and her number is A342166. All right. Here we have some holiday pet tips. Here are a few general pet holiday tips to keep in mind as you celebrate this month. If you're planning on going on a road trip for the holidays and want to bring your dog or cat along, remember a few key points to ensure a safe and fun ride for all. Dogs who enjoy car travel need not be confined to a carrier only if your vehicle has a restraining harness. Dogs and cats should always be kept safely inside the car. 
Pets who are allowed to stick their heads out of the window can be injured by particles of debris. Stop frequently to allow your pet to exercise and eliminate. Never permit your pet to leave the car without a collar, ID tag, and leash. If you are unable to bring your pet along for your holiday travels, it's important to book boarding for them well in advance. Space is limited and tends to fill up closer to the holidays. Be careful where you place candles around your home. Keep candles away from the swipe of your dog's tail or the curious paws of your cat, especially if they're lit. Even if the candles are unlit, be sure to keep an eye on them as the scented ones could be very tempting and ingesting those would be a bad idea. Your cat may want to romp through the discarded wrapping paper and boxes late Christmas morning, but remember to move, remove all bows and yarns first. Also, cut away shopping bag handles to prevent choking. We hope you and your pets have a safe and happy holiday season. Okay, what a beautiful color. This is Luke. Luke, get here, over here. Look at you. I just Thank love you. your coat color. Uh, Luke's number is A389914. And a puppy, nine months old. You were just saying. How do you, how do you know this is a puppy? I don't know. <laughs> so this is a brown and white pit bull. And um, boy, you sure you know, have but... some puppy energy. We need to, okay. See if we can do this. This is going to be a little hard, a little challenging here. He knows how to sit <laughs> um, and roll over. So let's see. Well, I don't think Luke, so. Too much going on here. Uh, well, but he likes playing. I think he, he needs to he likes, get out and run a couple yeah. of blocks before we're able to. And he likes playing with other buddy. dogs. Maybe we need to take him out for a play date. A play date. Wouldn't that be fun? What a cute little face. You just got to settle down. You just got to settle down. You're acting like a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, come here. So I love your name, Luke. So, so his adoption fee is 125. Right, that would include, and of course, his vaccines, neuter surgery, rabies vaccine, uh, microchip, um, and I think he's, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's okay. a real. He's gonna be oh. really a lot of fun. Um, we think, yeah, he's good with other dogs, so mm -hmm. he'd be a good uh, playmate, definitely yeah. for a young, active dog. Uh, so. could keep up with him <laughs> or a young active here, kid buddy. or adult <laughs> Come here. or an active senior boy you'd keep you'd keep us in shape wouldn't you Woo. So, but he's too cute so anyway let me give his number again you know you pit, th there's something about the pit bulls they just love to please their owners and and I'm sure when, when he settles down, he would sit and roll over and do anything for his owner. Well, you were saying. <laughs> so, I think so, oh, there he goes. Okay. Hi, buddy. Kevin is. <laughs> All right, this is quite, quite a demonstration here. <laughs> so. Um... <laughs> you are a goofball. You know what? This is what you're... I love about puppies. Though. I know. You know. They're just so I happy. Know. They're just... so. He's Lively. so silly. He's so silly. Animals are just wonderful. They're so Will you turn great around to so come we can home see your face? to. And just, Good boy. Just, just check out Facebook pages and you see how many posts there are for animals. <laughs> and by the way, we have some great on our Facebook pages, Pasadena Humane. Well, I love great the, uh, shots. There was one the other day of uh, some kittens wearing sweaters. Or sweaters or I know. Animals. I know. Just so awesome. cute. Do you do that? Yeah, our producer, Jamie, does all that, and it's, it, they're, they're so fun, uh, fun posts. Anyway, so definitely give us a like, and we'll be your friends. <laughs> <laughs> so Luke's number is A389914. <laughs> You're so happy. Oh, wait till you see this little guy coming. Oh, so, excuse me, it's a little girl. You Hello. are so cute. Hi. This is Claire. And Claire's number is A389816. So people can see you. And she's three years old. Just a cute little face. Three years old. And what is, what is she? Black and white. Uh, she too. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. You walk well on a leash. That is so amazing. <laughs> that is so amazing. We're so proud of you. She's obviously gentle and sweet. And her adoption fee would be 125. Yeah. So, 
Let me tell you, just, she, when she came in, she was so matted. Oh. Poor thing. We had to um, cut a bunch of mats out of her hair. So, But now she's looking much, much better. Mm -hmm. um, she got a bath the other day where they kind of did a little styling. But um, the whole time, just really sweet, nice-tempered. Um, so, yeah, we feel really badly. Like, she must have been super uncomfortable when she, oh, like, yeah. just, like, so really bad So she was a mess. real stray, had but, been out a while. Yeah, but oh. just still um, a little TLC, and she was just oh, look at as her. nice as you could be. She's, she's, so. And why do you think this is a great time of year to adopt a dog? Well, I think, you know, the big thing for us is that, you know, especially around yeah. the holidays, people have some time off from yeah. work or school yeah. or whatever, can really start getting their new pet yeah. into a routine. Yeah. Um, you know, if you already have a, a dog or a cat, it's a lot easier yeah. to get, you know, kind of yeah. have an idea of what your mm -hmm. plan is. Yeah. Um, I know whenever I've gotten, a, I mm -hmm. got my first dog and then the, he kind of got the other dogs into routines uh -huh. just by following along with his mm -hmm. lead. Um, so, I th you know, a little bit different with cats, obviously, oh, yeah. as you know. Well, I'm but, a cat person, Kevin. Well, I, I love dogs and cats, I, I obviously, cats but too. in bunnies and whatever <laughs> and hamsters. And, um, but th this, is, this is a good time. Not to give a gift. Not right, to, we don't right. recommend that, uh, although we have a great store here where you can get gifts. And I'll tell you, a lot of people who are yeah. thinking about getting, you know, their family right. members, uh, a, you know, a pet mm -hmm. as a gift, we always encourage to, hey, okay. bring them in, get them a yeah. gift certificate yeah. that would cover the adoption fee, mm -hmm. or even better, bring them in and let them be a part mm -hmm. of the, you know, the yeah. decision-making process. Um, so, you know, it might not be such a welcome surprise, yeah. so. Yeah, so it's better to select your own pet, but. But uh, our our cats always get toys well, at this brought, time of year. Wrapped up to me, I might not be so upset. Ah, mm -hmm. <laughs> you you'd keep it right. Ah. So. But no, it's a, it's an individual yeah. individual choice. Well, I, we're so happy that she's here now. Let me give you her number again. Again, this is Claire, but you can give her any name that you like. And her number is a three eight nine eight one six. And she would like to be home for the holidays. Oh, yeah. She's yeah. a love. Wouldn't she be a love? Keep you nice and warm. And, uh, you know, just... So sweet. And then, of course, we kind of tend to overeat. What? Over the holidays. So dogs are wonderful to take walks and <laughs> get us, keep us in shape. You know, that's So we really can get good... have an extra piece of candy. <laughs> Uh, after so, other holiday meals, so it's always I, good to be, I, I, you know, I, instead of sitting on the couch, go take your dog for a walk. I highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. We've had some real little energetic walkers on this, you know, yes. be great to walk with. So uh, anyway, we did it. We As did it know. again. Yeah. And um, before I forget, we want to wish everyone a happy holiday. That's right. But, and uh, again, so, it's our last show of the year. So, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you for helping us help the animals all this year. We've, we've run into people all the time and have some great stories. Yeah. But if you haven't seen an animal here, this is a great time of year if you have time off. Uh, we can be reached by phone at 626-792-7151. As I mentioned, we're all over social media. Um, Jamie, our producer, does a fantastic job. And, and uh, if you haven't checked so, out our Instagram, there, so. we have two Instagram pages, is that right? Uh, so our two PHS Instagram. Uh, Instagram and then also our Neely Cat Center, which has adorable oh. pictures of, of cats and kittens. Great. It's really fun and, um, yeah, like really get a, a good kind of insight into all the animals that we have here. And, Absolutely. And some of the things we do. Absolutely. And I, I might point out, I forgot to mention this, um, we got posters all over our neighborhood of a lost dog. Uh, the best thing is you go on our website, PasadenaHumane.org, and if you've lost an animal, uh, you just have a really good chance of seeing your animal found That's and right. a picture. So come we on down. We update that hourly, so it's you know, really yeah. very up to date through the PasadenaHumane.org. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, the website is really we all newly redesigned. I don't know mm -hmm. if we talked about that last time or not, but it, mm -hmm. it's fantastic. It's, it's really user friendly. and. I love it. It's well, got a lot of great the site that I go to every single day. <laughs> <laughs> little plugs there. So, but the best way is so to 
come down and see us. We are at 361 South Raymond Avenue in Pasadena. From Glendale, you take the 210 freeway. You get off at the Del Mar exit. Uh, take a left on Del Mar, right onto Raymond. We have plenty of underground parking. It's really easy. You just pull right in. And we would love to see you here. And you're guaranteed to go home happy. <laughs> so. Anyway, so that's it. Um, well, let's thank our volunteers who yeah. helped us out today. Um, of course, Judy and Andrea and Jamie and um, Tara. Sierra. Oh, Sierra. Oh, sorry, Sierra. I don't know why I can't remember. Anyway, and, and staff. I'm getting old. Luke, Jamie, our producer, and Henri Camera. Ryland and, and, and Rob. It's a, uh, not your Rob, other Rob yeah. for uh, bringing us equipment at yes, the last we, minute. Uh, yes, we didn't Patrick. have a microphone. And we Patrick only back microphone. at the station. And of course, Patrick. Patrick, thank you so much. Patrick's a volunteer, right? Everyone knows that garbage belongs in a garbage can. But in 2009, a total of 1,387,521 pounds of trash and recyclables were picked up during the California Coastal Cleanup Day. For the past five years, these numbers have grown, and for the past 24 years, cigarette butts were the most littered item. Did you know that most of the trash that ends up in the ocean is a result of urban runoff? That means that whenever someone litters in Glendale, their trash ends up in a storm drain. All Glendale storm drains lead to the Los Angeles River. The LA River empties into the ocean, our local beaches. Please, help us keep Glendale and our planet beautiful. Stop littering and adopt the neighborhood you live in. Visit cleanupglendale.org to find out how you can help. And remember, don't trash Glendale. Bikes ride free on the Glendale B-Line. Our fast-loading, high-quality bike racks are designed to make your transition from bike to bus fast, safe, and easy. When the bus arrives, get the attention of the bus driver with a wave or signal so he knows to wait for you to load your bike. Squeeze the rack handle up to release the latch and then fold the bike rack down. Lift your bike onto the bike rack, fitting the wheels into the wheel slots. Then pull the spring-loaded support arm forward over the front tire so that the hook rests on the top of the front wheel. That's it! Just board the bus! When you get 
to your destination, use the front door to exit the bus. Remind the bus driver that you will be getting your bike. Raise the support arm off the tire. Lift your bike out of the rack. If there are no bikes on the rack and no one else is waiting to load their bike, raise the bike rack up and you will feel it lock in place. Move away from the bus to the curb after unloading your bike. Then you are on your way. Lendale Beeline lets me ride where I want, when I want. Hi, and welcome to On The Move, a show highlighting what's going on in your community. I'm your host, Tamar Asad. In this month's show, we'll check out a fun holiday craft idea, meet a very merry Parks employee, see where you can do your holiday shopping, and so much more. Glendale offers a year-round Meals on Wheels program for our seniors. Let's meet a festive member of our Parks Department who helps brighten the holidays for our seniors. Hello, I'm Maggie Kavarian with the City of Glendale's Community Services and Parks Department. I'm the Community Services Supervisor overseeing the Senior Nutritional Meals Program. Our program offers seniors a lunch every day of the week at the Adult Recreation Center, five days a week at Spar Heights Community Center, and three days a week at Pacific Park Community Center. When our seniors become elderly and frail and are unable to attend our meal program site, we offer the Home Delivered Meals Program. Hi, I'm Vladimir. I deliver meals to seniors. During the holidays, I like to do a little surprise for them, so I dress up as a Santa and put a little smile on their faces. This is a great program because it provides hope, life, and happiness to our seniors. Sometimes I'm only the person they see or during the week. They're always happy to see me. But he also gives them a well-being checkup, sometimes takes out their trash, as well as puts their food away. We are very lucky here at the City of Glendale to have such a wonderful program to serve the aging population. For more information on the Senior Nutritional Meals Program, please contact us at 818-548-3775 or check us out on our city's website. We all know how to recycle, but do you know how to upcycle? Let's check out some fun holiday craft ideas with things you already have around the house. Coming to you from the North Pole, my name is Lauren Bowe, Glendale's Public Works Elf, to show you how you can upcycle everyday household items. What is upcycling? Here are some examples of upcycled crafts. Upcycling is creative reuse, transforming materials that would have otherwise been thrown away or recycled into something useful and beautiful. With the holidays coming up quick, here's an easy DIY craft you can do with your family and friends. Here's what you'll need. A black marker, red crayons or colored pencils, toilet paper rolls, a paintbrush, a single hole puncher, red paint, glue, cotton balls, ribbon, something to put your paint in, and paper. Step one, remove any excess toilet paper. Step two, begin painting your roll. Make sure when you're painting it, you're applying an even coat. Wait five to 10 minutes for the paint to dry. Step three, once the paint is dry, pick one end of the roll and fold the sides inwards to make a triangle. This will be Santa's head. Then you're going to go on the opposite side of the roll and fold the front and back inwards to make Santa's feet. Step four, get your single hole puncher and hole punch the tip of the triangle. This is going to be where you thread the ribbon through so that you can hang it on your tree. Step five, start threading the ribbon through the hole. Make sure you tie it in a knot and it's secure. Cut off any excess ribbon. Step six, get your cotton ball. It might be a little too big, so you can cut it in half. Then glue your cotton ball to cover the hole. Step seven, it's time to make Santa's face. Get your white paper and cut off a corner 
so that you have a triangle. Then measure it to his face. Get your markers. Draw Santa's eyes. Color in his cheeks. Step eight, glue on Santa's face. Now Santa's ready for some footwear. Step nine, grab your marker and start drawing on his belt buckle, feet, and hands. And here's what your Santa should look like. If you want to use your toilet paper roll for another idea, you can also use it as a gift box. These are just two of the many upcycle crafts you can do on your own. If you're interested in making your own, Public Works is hosting their first annual upcycle craft contest. When making your craft, at least 90% must be used from recycled materials. The contest opens on December 1st at 9 a.m. and closes on December 28th at 5 p.m. There's going to be a mystery prize that you don't want to miss out on. For more information about the contest, go to our Facebook or Twitter at MyGlendalePW. Thanks for joining us. Happy Holidays! Glendale is expecting a wetter than average year with El Nino. Let's meet Mayor Arna Dryan with ideas on how to get prepared. Hello. I'm Ara Najarian, mayor of the city of Glendale. I am pleased to announce the launch of ElNinoReady.org. I am sure you've heard that El Nino is forecasted to be one of the strongest on record this year. There is an extraordinary amount of rain that will likely cause flooding. So what has the city done to get ready? The cities of Glendale, Burbank, and Pasadena have partnered on an education campaign and created a new website. You can learn how to use a sandbag, how to protect your home and pets, and how to register for storm alerts. Let's be El Nino ready. Log on to ElNinoReady.org and follow us on Twitter at Verdugo Alert for updates as they become available. Uh, we are going to talk about El Nino. Um, and the main question we have, not only for the city, but for all of you, is are we El Nino ready? Again, we, we talk about preparing, uh, creating an emergency kit. You want one in the home, the work, your car, but these are the items that we have here, you know, food, water, three days, one week. Don't forget your pets, first aid kit, flashlight, batteries, radio. Uh, tune the radio to the different channels there. They'll be reporting on that. Uh, any medications, over-the-counter prescription, uh, cash becomes very important, especially when you uh, start losing power and you need that ability to purchase uh, clothing, sturdy shoes, uh, tools, wrenches, and any sanitation and uh, hygiene supplies. But it's good to do that now. It's a good time to uh, uh, build that kit. Some basic steps that you can take to prepare your home and protect your property. First of all, you should clean up all the debris and objects in your yard that you don't really need, that could be blown away or washed away. You should clear all drains and gutters of debris and make sure they are functioning properly. Check for loose tiles, holes, or other signs of potential trouble on your roof. Inspect the retaining walls on your property for signs of malfunction. If you have any slopes in and around your property, Inspect them for signs of gullies, surface cracks, slumping, or any other erosion issues. Place mulch and plant native plants on bare ground to prevent mud flows. If there are storm drains on your property, check for obstructions and clear them of rocks, vegetation, and dirt. You can get 10 free unfilled empty sandbags at any of our fire stations within the city. Understand the role of the police department in these type of emergencies is really to do one thing, and that's to protect life and property. 911 is what you would call if you have an emergency. If you have a true emergency, we want you to call and tell us what the problem is, where the problem is. Uh, never try to cross flooded areas in a car or on foot. Never touch down power lines. Uh, we don't know sometimes what's live and what's not. If an intersection is blacked out, it's to be treated as a four-way stop with alternating vehicles allowing people to travel through the intersection. Be prepared to evacuate and no alternative routes. 
We hope by doing pre-planning, you'll have things in place so that if you have to leave, you'll be able to leave and take the things with you that you'll need. Evacuation shelters will be decided at the time of the event, depending on where the event is occurring and the severity of it. We have a contract with Pasadena Humane who provides animal care services for the city of Glendale. They will bring out mobile trailers that will allow you to have your pet at the shelter site so that you don't have to worry about what do I do with my pet. The city of Glendale has a mass notification system known as Everbridge. You can register for Everbridge on our city website. In that system, it allows you to indicate how you would like to be notified, whether it's on your cell phone, if you want a text message, if you want it on your landline, on an email. The number you request to be your primary resource should probably be the number that you have with you the majority of the time. We highly recommend that you view our Twitter account, and if you can, follow us on Twitter at MyGlendale. Go to this website called ElNinoReady.org. This is a tri-city webpage with the cities of Burbank, Glendale, and Pasadena. So each of the cities have their El Nino preparation, sandbag availability, your sign up for local alerts and upcoming meetings, etc., and so on. If you are following that same information, you are getting at the same time as the media outlets. It's coming right out of the emergency operations center. Hey Glendale, you've assembled your disaster kit and are prepared in the event of an emergency. But have you left anyone important out of your plan? Don't forget the animals in your life. In the event of an emergency, your faithful furry or scaly companions will be relying on you. Let's get the ball rolling. Your animal will need supplies such as food and water, medications and veterinary records, sturdy leashes, harnesses and carriers, current photos of your pets, pet beds and toys that are easy to transport. Travel may be limited in the event of an emergency. Make a list of options for shelters and accommodations. Our animal friends come in all shapes and sizes. Think about the special needs and concerns for yours. Disasters and evacuations are unpredictable in nature, so be sure to plan beforehand. The City of Glendale wants to make sure you're prepared. For more info, go to the City of Glendale Pet Preparedness link. The holidays are fast approaching, and that means the big shopping rush is upon us. Glendale is a regional shopping destination with everything from high-end retailers to boutique stores, so there's sure to be something for everyone on your list. For the gift that fits everyone, pick up a gift card to the Glendale Galleria or Americana at Brand. The Glendale Galleria is home to Bloomingdale's, Macy's, Zara, and the brand new Dick's Sporting Goods. Just across the street at the Americana brand, your gift card recipients will find Nordstrom, Sephora, Cole Haan, and the newly opened Tory Birch. With centrally located parking throughout downtown Glendale, it is easy to access the Galleria and Americana to get the gift that fits everyone's style. Shopping for someone who loves the arts? Give the gift of entertainment. The Alex Theatre has concerts, comedies, and performances already scheduled through early 2016. The beautiful Alex Theatre is a cultural experience that is also rich in history. Gift a night out with a show and complete it with dinner at one of downtown Glendale's many dining options. The downtown offers every ethnic cuisine for upscale sit-down dining before the show or a quick bite after. The holidays tend to be a little chaotic with parties and shopping, but they should also be a time for family and friends. Sometimes the greatest gift is the gift of time. We invite you to slow down in Glendale's quaint areas of Kenneth Village or Montrose for a brunch or dinner date with someone special. They both offer specialty gift stores so you can pop in after to find the unique present. Feeling really generous? Brand Boulevard of Cars has 16 dealerships so you can find the perfect car to cruise into the new year. With Lexus, Acura, BMW, and so many more, there is a car for every budget and style. 
To find other great shopping locations throughout Glendale and Montrose, please check the websites of our partners at the Glendale Chamber of Commerce, Montrose Verdugo Chamber of Commerce, Crescenta Valley Chamber of Commerce, Downtown Glendale Association, and Montrose Shopping Park Association. The City of Glendale's Economic Development Team wishes you and your family a very happy holiday season. You may have noticed all the shopping ideas had minimal to no wrapping. As you consider packaging and wrapping for your holiday gifts, please also consider the environment. Let's learn more about Glendale's refuse collection process. The Public Works Integrated Waste Division provides a wide variety of material collection services to the community. These services include automated residential container collection, bin service for commercial businesses and multifamily residents, bulky item pickup, e-waste and metals collection, and bin rental services. But waste management doesn't stop at the curb. We need our customers' help to reduce and recycle our waste stream to improve our community's sustainability by separating materials properly. Our customers can help by taking a little time to properly separate waste goods before disposing of them. The recycling containers used for plastic bottles and containers, 